Lord God, we're here because you've brought us here. Only because you've brought us here. Nothing else that we do in this room at any time, day or night, any week, any year, any month, makes any difference without you. And we need to be reminded of that again and again and again because it's so easy for us to just go running off on our own thing, trying to explain our own deal, and every time we make a mess of it. So we thank you that you're here. We thank you that you wrote such powerful words through your servant Paul. Um, please help us to hear these words today absent any human interference. Just your voice, your spirit, your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're in Galatians. And today I'm calling this not for a moment. Because we've got to consider what it means to give in to something for even a moment. Okay? But before we do that, We've got to do a quick review. We've covered a lot of ground the last couple of weeks. So um, just to help everybody catch up. In Galatians 1, verses 1 through 5, Paul explains that what he's going to be talking to the Galatians about is the gospel, not legalism. And we all know that the Galatians were having a terrible, terrible time with legalism. But that wasn't what Paul wanted to talk to them about. Look in those first five verses if you've got your Bibles with you and notice that he covers the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Without those two things, we might as well just go play in the street. Okay? So that's where he starts, is with the gospel. Well, why does he start there? Because in verses 6 through 10... There's a problem. They've got other teachers who are teaching a different gospel, something different than Paul brought them. And how, how does he describe it? It's no gospel at all. If it's not the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, it is not a gospel. It may be an interesting story, it may be powerful. It could move you to do things you never thought possible, and it's pointless because it's a different gospel. The strongest words in the New Testament in that passage right there, verses 6 through 10. You want to get Paul angry with you? Suggest that there's some other gospel. And he would tell you, you would be eternally condemned, and he would repeat it. That's how serious he is about the gospel. Hasn't said one word about legalism yet. The gospel is everything. So in verses 11 through 24, we deal with the first of the accusations. Paul's gospel is made up. It's of human origin. Either he made it up himself out of whole cloth, or somebody gave it to him, but, you know, he, he's not the real deal. You know, he, he wasn't there with Jesus. He's not one of the apostles. He's... He's not worthy of being listened to. And how did he describe it? That he received his gospel by what? By revelation. Let me tell you, I am so glad that the first place I heard the gospel was from someone else like me. Because if I was riding my horse to Damascus, and Jesus showed up and said, oh, by the way, you know, I mean, that's how important Paul was to Jesus. And that's how wrong Paul was. That Jesus himself came to him and said, you think you're doing me a favor, but I'm the one you're persecuting. By the way, here's the gospel. I'm the gospel. You're looking at the gospel. The gospel is blinding you this moment. So he wanders in, you know, is led into Damascus, and Ananias is sent to him. There's one of those, those reasons why anybody who comes to you and says, can I be a prophet? Can I be a prophet? 
Ananias was a prophet. God came to him and said, oh, there's this guy named Saul. Uh, he's in a house on Straight Street. And I want you to go talk to him. You say, what? I mean, he's here to kill people like me. And God says, no, I want you to go talk to him. He's mine. What? He's here to kill people like me. No, he's mine. And I need you to go explain to him all the things he must suffer on account of me. <laughs> you know, Paul, I'm here to, to tell you that, you know, Jesus said you're going to suffer. You know, I'll just, you know, I'll stand out in the street and shout to you, Saul. You know. No, Ananias obeyed by faith. What else is he going to go on? Remember that? Faith, faith, faith. Ananias complained. God said, no, he's my chosen vessel. Ananias said, I don't understand it. I'll go. He went. He explained the gospel to Paul. The scales fell off of his eyes. Boy, that's meaningful. Somebody as steeped in the law as Paul, literally the scales had to fall off of his eyes so that he could see Jesus. So that, that's chapter 1. That took us two weeks. Just to give you the context again, this is the part of the world we've been dealing with. And in today's pre-study, there were three places mentioned. Jerusalem, down there on the bottom, where the, the lowest red arrow is. Antioch, where the middle arrow is. And then up and to the, the left there, Tarsus. The third red arrow. Okay. So things are happening here. Now in the middle of all of this is a missionary journey that takes Paul you know, over there where we talked about before. But today's pre-study, because of the issues that are being dealt with, took place in these three cities. So here's the first pre-study, Acts 11, 19 to 30. Paul has gone back home. He, sent, he was sent home, sent to Tarsus. You know, he got saved, spent quite a few days in Damascus. Uh, they tried to kill him, so he, he ran away, spent some time in Arabia, came back to Damascus, had to leave again, went down to Jerusalem to say hi, and everybody went, oh, you've got to be kidding me. And finally, you know, some of the, the pe people accepted him, very few. And then the Jews tried to kill him, so they, they ran him down to the coast, put him on a boat, and sent him home to Tarsus. And there Paul is in Tarsus, learning, 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 learning. Paul couldn't keep his mouth shut, so he was talking to other people about all of this. And um, when, when the, the Jews who had been part of the believers left Jerusalem when Saul himself was persecuting them after after Stephen, a bunch of them have gone up to Antioch, some of them to Tarsus. They started hearing this guy, this guy named Paul, and he's, he's teaching something that they never heard him say before, and there's response, and the believers are hearing this guy, and they join up with him, and, and they finally word gets back to Jerusalem. And they send Barnabas up there to see what's going on. He, he takes one step into Antioch, realizes the impact that the gospel is having, and ran over to Tarsus and found Saul and said, I need you to come with me. Any wonder how he got his name, Son of Encouragement? I would have been tempted to leave Saul in Tarsus and say, I'm glad he's saved. Good riddance. I mean, that, that's me. No, these people, these people were on fire. Anyone who would respond to their teaching responded to the teaching of Jesus himself. And then those people were on fire. I mean, compare what's going on in this part of the world in that part of the first century A.D., and then read the, the message in Revelation to the church of Laodicea, and God is saying, I wish you either loved me or hated me. But this I don't care attitude has got to stop. And that message has been applicable to every church and every member in every church since that time. 
Because the gospel of Jesus Christ will set you on fire if you understand it. Anything else, any other gospel, anything else that begins to take precedence is going to snuff out that fire and you will be so hard pressed to find it you wonder what in the world you're doing every Sunday morning or Wednesday night or whenever you go to church. Why go to church? Who cares? Right? There's nothing there for me. These people were on fire. Barnabas went and got Saul, started calling him Paul, his, his Greek name. And then they heard about a famine down in, in Palestine. And they collected a whole bunch of food and money and things like that and went down to Jerusalem. Actually, you always go up to Jerusalem. They went south to Jerusalem and delivered all of that stuff. So Paul is there meeting people again. And then in Acts 25, there's this little piece about Peter being put in prison and the angel leads him out. And Herod was in Jerusalem then. And Herod says, why did he get out? So they examined the guards to figure out why he got out. Nobody had an answer, so he just had them killed. He goes back home, a little further north in the country, and because the famine is still on, people come to him to make a treaty, and he claims godness. The angel of the Lord struck him down. That's a pretty blatant statement right there in, in the Bible. I mean, people call in all the time and say, well, what's the difference between the God in the Old Testament and the God in the New Testament? Nothing. You get in God's face in the New Testament like Herod did, he's going to deal with you. Herod was a thoroughly wicked man. And to take on the, the, the claims of the crowd as if he were the real deal was too much, even for a God of mercy and justice. And so the angel of the Lord struck him down and he died. And then in verse 25, it says, after their mission was accomplished, Paul and Barnabas went back to Antioch. Okay. And then after the first missionary journey, there's this council at Jerusalem. Okay. Remember when Peter gave that magnificent speech about why should we be asking the Gentiles to be under the law when we ourselves can't take it, can't keep it, can't do anything with it except fail? It's done its work. Let's leave it there. So we're in chapter 2, Galatians 2. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas, I took Titus along also. Fascinating stuff here. Trying to figure out when all these years happened is a bit of a stretch. Um, we get hints. There's nothing absolute. We think Paul was converted around 33 or 34, somewhere in that time frame. 34 to 36, spent time in Arabia wandering around, probably teaching. He couldn't help but teach. But spent most of that time studying, relearning. Then he went to Jerusalem. Then he went on his first missionary journey. That, that 46 Jerusalem is the, the purpose was to bring the food, the supplies. And then the first missionary journey from 46 to 48, and then the Jerusalem Council in 48 or 49. 14 years. All that time from 36 to 46, Paul's up in Tarsus and Antioch, relearning, having all the error knocked out of him. Um, what an amazing thing that God did for Paul. He not only stopped him in his tracks and said, no, you're mine because you're, you're persecuting me. He took all of the time that God knew Paul needed to teach him the gospel, to 
to teach him the ramifications of the gospel, to teach him how to apply the gospel to everyday life. Because if the law is good for anything, it's good for everyday life. Right? If you've ever read any part of the law, there's all kinds of neat stuff there about how to wash your clothes, how to wash your hands, how to take care of sickness, how to take care of dead things, how to, how to sacrifice, how to run your, your group. There's a lot of things there, but when you've made that your God, when the real guy shows up that that law is only a shadow of, you can't see him. Paul couldn't see Jesus. He had to be taught to see Jesus. And God did the teaching. Jesus did the teaching. The Holy Spirit inside of Paul did that teaching. That's important when we get a couple of verses ahead. We'll come back to it. Verse 2. Why did Paul go? Was he summoned there? No. I went in response to a revelation. God said, go on to Jerusalem. Go to that meeting. It's important. I need you there. So Paul says, sure, I'll go. He had a revelation to be there, so he went. Notice this, meeting privately. Meeting privately. What is the, the example we keep giving here of the very worst thing to do to a, a minister or a pastor? You show up and you hear the sermon on 1 John 1, 9, and on the way out the door in front of God and everybody, you say, you know you're wrong. That's not the way to do it. When you've got a message, meet privately. Right? You go to them one-on-one. -on -one. If they won't listen, you take some more people. If they won't listen to that, then you make it public. But you don't start public. You don't start by calling somebody out because you can't win. Remember, this is about the gospel. It's not about legalism. We'll see. So with those esteemed as leaders, I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. Now think about this carefully. What was Paul asking them? If you're thinking he went there privately and said, is there any part of this message that's wrong? That's an incorrect answer. How did Paul get his gospel? By revelation. He was absolutely convinced that what he was teaching was correct. So what did he want to see if he'd been running his race in vain? He wanted to see if the people in Jerusalem were teaching the same gospel and if in fact they had fellowship one with another. He wasn't going to ask for, for permission or for correction or for anything else. He went to ask them, what is it that you're teaching here in Jerusalem and in Judea? I want to know. As I present my gospel, here's what I'm teaching. What are you teaching? Are we the same or are we different? That's a critical point. Paul was not going to change his message. He may change his affiliation, but he wasn't going to change his message. Right? Critical, critical point. Before you start in on this corrective process, you'd better know what you believe. And you don't figure out what you believe by sitting here listening to me, or listening to our radio broadcast, or listening to any of the tapes and reading the books, or the CDs. That's not how you, you figure out what you believe. Those things suggest all manner of truth to you. But until you get into the Word of God and say, Lord, if you don't teach me, I know nothing, then you will know nothing. And then, when you are certain, when you are convinced of what you believe, 
uh, then you'll be able to deal with the honest give and take of a conversation with someone who may not believe the same as you do. You'll be able to discern when the, the message is a little off and how to ask questions and, and you know, leading them around to what the Bible teaches. Very rarely do you get anything done by reaching across the table and punching somebody in the nose. Um, I, I was kind of one of those people, not much, not really much, but uh, when I was at Hewlett Packard, I had a manager, not my manager, an upper manager come to me one day and say, Richard, you need to learn something here. That it's not that you're wrong. You just got to learn to stop burning bridges. Because you may be working with this person in a six months or a year or two years. You need to be in relationship with these people. Yeah, you can correct them and they can correct you. But, you know, but don't have a scorched earth policy. What, me? Well, I, I'm just right. You know, I, I can't help it that they're that way. No, stop burning bridges. This is about the gospel. This is about Jesus. This isn't about me or you. Okay? So keep that point in mind. Paul wasn't going there for correction. He was going there to find out if we are one in the Spirit. He can't help it. <clears throat> he has to interject this. Yet not even Titus. Now, Titus was the test case. Paul could go back to Jerusalem with Barnabas because Barnabas was a Levite. He was Jewish. They could show up. They still had the clothes. They had the outfits. You know, you can be Jewish too if you have the outfit. Actually, you can't. But they had the outfits. They had the training. They could walk into the temple any time of the temple grounds, and fit in. But they brought Titus. Titus is a Greek. Titus could care less about all of the meaningful things that, that the Jews had, all of the, the wonderful ceremony, the, you know, all of the wonderful songs, all, you know, whatever it was that made up Jewishness in those days. Titus had no idea. He'd probably learned a little bit from Paul and Barnabas, but it, you know, it's the difference between kind of studying history and living history. You know, those of you who were here in Dallas when President Kennedy was shot, you have a completely different understanding of what occurred than those of us who didn't live here at the time. Same thing with, with Titus. They took Titus, and not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised even though he was a Greek. There's a telling statement. That's how you know that the question, are we one in the Spirit, was answered with a resounding yes. Yes. It is the gospel. Look at verse 4. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. Now, that's a, a pretty telling verse. Um, let me show it to you in the New American Standard because it doesn't take things away in order to make it more readable. Because it, but it was because of the false brethren secretly brought in who had sneaked in. See the reput repetition there? They were secretly brought in and they sneaked in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, in order to bring us into bondage. This word, these phrases, secretly brought in and sneaked in, they're ver used very, very few times in the New Testament. I think there's only like one other time other than this verse. And... <laughs> This is a terrible word. It literally has to do with someone who, who is brought in as if they represent you. And they make friends with you. And then you realize all along they've been stabbing you in the back. People who Paul thought were brothers in Christ because that's the way they presented themselves. Right? Any one of us here 
can walk the walk, talk the talk, make it look like we're the best believers that ever showed up on God's green earth. And there's no guarantee that the behavior represents reality inside. And so when they, they are brought in secretly and they sneak into the meetings and they sneak into the conversations and the small group Bible studies and your one-on-one -on -one conversations, what they're really doing is spying out your liberty and to bring you back to bondage. What a terrible, terrible thing. Paul was told by God to go to Jerusalem so that he could expose these people because they claimed that they were coming from James. They claimed that. Even James said, no, they don't represent me. So Titus wasn't required to be circumcised and these people were exposed for who they were and what they represented. Why? Because of the gospel. Because of the gospel. One of the reasons I think Paul was sent to the Gentiles, I can't prove this, I'm just wondering how these things come together. It's because Paul, if he had gone to his own people, would have met them mind for mind, argument for argument, quotation from the fathers for quotation from the fathers. Quotations from the Torah, or each quotation from the Torah. And they would have had this wonderful academic argument. And they would have even called each other nice names. You know, brother, my, my esteemed colleague. Um, if you ever are reading a refereed journal of any kind, in any, any subject matter, whether it's music or science or arts or religion, if an article starts as a rebuttal to a previous argument, or to a previous article, and it starts with, my esteemed colleague. You know what the person is saying is, you dirty so-and-so. <laughs> it's, it's, you, you, you look at this and you go, oh, they're in agreement. And three paragraphs in, they're just ripping them to shreds. My esteemed colleague, nothing. You know, if you'd have been parked behind me, I'd have run you over. So these people followed Paul back. In fact, they had gone up there to Antioch, the other churches, and had come back to Jerusalem and were saying, oh, these people, all these Gentiles, oh, they're filth. Bothers me to be in the same room with them, in the same town with them. Paul doesn't ask them to do anything. Just accept Jesus. And you, you know yourself that it's Jesus and Paul comes back. They have the conversation. We did not give in to them for a moment. For a moment. If you've got a, a New American Standard Bible, the word moment there is hour. But that's about as far into time as they got with an hour. So it says not even for an hour. In our day and age, we'd say not even a nanosecond or a picosecond. Not even a moment. Why did they not give in for a moment? Now, the tendency would be that I knew they were wrong, I was going to argue them into the dust, and they would be in abject fear before me. That's what we'd like to do. That's not what Paul did. Paul did this so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. Remember what I said at the beginning? This isn't about legalism. It's about the gospel. Legalism is a symptom, but it's not a symptom in the way we normally think of it. Legalism is a symptom that someone doesn't understand who Jesus is and what he's done. And if you don't understand who he is and what he's done and then what he's continuing to do every moment of the day, you're going to go to legalism because that's what we do. I get up in the morning, a legalist. 
And it's only the grace of God reminding me who I am in Jesus Christ that lets me back off of the legalism in my human flesh and walk by faith in the grace of God. If it wasn't for, for the Holy Spirit indwelling us, we would spend every moment of every day trying to figure out how to be better and how to make other people look worse so that at least I look better than they do. That's human nature. Paul doesn't go there. He doesn't have that argument with the legalists. He says, who is Jesus? What did Jesus do? What was his death worth? And if he'd get an answer for that, then he'd say, what was his resurrection worth? And if he got an answer for that, he'd say, what is that together worth to you? What does it mean? Who is it saving? And how is it saving them? Suddenly, you're not talking about behavior anymore because we all fall short. Every legalist knows that. That's why they're a legalist. So I'm so tired of looking in the mirror and seeing the failure looking back at me that I will do anything to make myself look better. Anything. Right? I hate to keep giving political examples, but there's so many of them these days. There's, there's some bit of legislation that has that had to do with maintaining the interest rate for a certain kind of student loan at a particular level. I don't care whether you're for it or against it. it that's what the law was. Okay. Well, this is an election year, and it was going to expire this year. And both parties are in favor of maintaining that interest rate. Both parties. But neither party was willing to pass legislation to keep that in place because it would give the other party something to say. That's the state of the intermediate school, junior high, that is Washington, D.C. Right? And you know what would happen if you and I took it over? The same thing. Right? That kind of power mixed with our kind of flesh is almost an inevitability that, that fraud and abuse happens. Believe it or not, it's the same way in church organizations. If you've got a church, or a member of a church, or a ministry that is worried so much about their parishioners' behavior that they quit focusing on Jesus, you're going to get the same kind of behaviors, same kind of attitudes, because these are the attitudes that are common to every one of us in the flesh. But if you're walking in the Spirit, by faith in the indwelling Spirit of Jesus Christ, you have a fighting chance to overcome the flesh. Give you a hint, that's what chapter 5 is about. The person who's lost can't have the conversation we're having. Because the person who is lost doesn't have the spirit, all they've got is the flesh and the legalism that comes along with it. The person who is saved is indwelt by the spirit, and so we have the mind of Christ saying, are you sure? Wouldn't you rather look at it this way? And at first we go, well, Lord, I, I think I'm pretty sure about this. He says, okay, let me know how that's working for you. Well, the fourth time we go, oh, Lord, he said, are you ready to listen? Shall we have a conversation? Notice it's never condemnation. He never slams the door on his way out. In fact, he never leaves. He's right there with you every step of the way in every legalistic decision you make, everything you fail in, everything you succeed in. The Holy Spirit is there saying, let's reason together. Let me teach you like you've never been taught. No condemnation. That alone should tell us that forgiveness is a done deal. If you're feeling condemnation, if you're feeling dirty, it's because Satan's pounding on you. It's not God. And Paul wanted to preserve the truth of the gospel for the Galatians and everyone else, but in this letter, for the Galatians. 
because it's only the gospel of Jesus Christ that gives you any kind of an answer to the flesh. And if you don't understand the gospel and you're trying to talk about freedom, all people are going to see is license. And license is another form of bondage. It's another form of legalism, to tell you the truth. And Paul wants to preserve the gospel for these people every step of the way. So he doesn't give in to these interlopers, these people who snuck in and tried to make slaves of them again, he doesn't give in for one moment because the gospel is too important. We are going to run into people all of the time who don't have a clue about the gospel. All they know is that, you know, I, I'm missing something, so I'm trying harder. That's all they know. It works in the workplace, it works at school, it works in sports, it works in music, works everywhere but between me and God, right? I mean, last night we had a chance to, to go see opera at, at one of the least imagined venues you can imagine. We went to watch opera at Cowboy Stadium. Now, um, I had never been to Cowboy Stadium and now that I know that all events there have free parking, and, and when you go in, they say, well, you can sit anywhere you want. And so we were sit, sitting in the leather seats in, in the concourse area there. I'm going to go to all the games now. <laughs> it was comfortable. It was air-conditioned. <laughs> I think the seat I was sitting in probably cost somebody $50,000 a year to sit in. And I, I got to sit in for free last night. And we watched opera. Well, if you've ever been around people who sing, especially people who sing at that level, uh, first of all, a confession. After hearing them sing, the last thing I wanted to come to do today is sing. <laughs> that ain't me. You know? and these people have worked their entire lives in a very legalistic system to hone their craft so that when you hear those notes come out of their mouths, it just... Well, it works there. But it doesn't work here. Because this is God's stuff. This is stuff we could never in our lives manufacture. Because only Jesus can do it in and through us. That's why Paul is preserving the gospel. As for those who were held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. See, the way I read that is the way humans read it. <clears throat> Everybody's nodding. Yeah, well. God does not show favoritism. He's not being arrogant here. He's not, he doesn't care that they were leaders or not leaders. He only knows that these are people like him who are sharing the gospel. And the point is what? They added nothing to my message. Nothing. I think it's safe to say they took nothing away. Nor did I add anything to their message. Nor did I take anything away from their message. Why? On the contrary, they recognized that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised or the Gentiles, <clears throat> just as Peter had been to the circumcised or to the Jews. There are many, many people who take this verse and say, see there, there's a Gentile gospel and there's a Jewish gospel. What did Paul say? The task of preaching the gospel, not the Gentile gospel or a gospel, the gospel. 
my audience happens to be Gentiles. Peter's audience happens to be Jews, for the most part. You know they both talked with Jews and Gentiles, but for the most part, that's where they were headed. But it's the gospel. How do you know it's the gospel? First he says it. Back in chapter 1 he says, if it's anything other than this gospel that I received by revelation, it's no gospel at all. There cannot be two gospels. Cannot. We all get the same gospel. Because if there were two gospels, there wouldn't be one in Christ. If there were two gospels, there would be Jews and Gentiles, and slave and free, and male and female. But because there is one gospel, there is no Jew or Gentile. There is no male or female. There is no slave or free. And these people got together with all of the history and baggage and stuff that they brought to the table. Because you know Paul had baggage. You know Peter and James. Think about being James. Jesus' brother. Talk about baggage. I mean, they hated him. And why not? He was everything they weren't. And they rejected him. Ah, go away. Just sit down and shut up. And then James got it. And he becomes a leader. So out of this soup of humanity, God forms his church, his body. And the world has never been the same. Because they recognized the gospel. For God, who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. Notice how he he doesn't talk about an organization for but a second. He always brings it back to God, the indwelling spirit. After you've been through some tough things, God quite often will, you know, wait a few months and then he'll take you on a guided tour through what happened. I know he did that for me. Our Lois and my journey out of the church we were raised in was long and twisted and painful and, and all of that. And, you know, afterwards, when I'd be getting down on myself, you know, oh, I don't understand, you know, I blew it again, or whatever. He'd say, oh, no, Richard, look where I took you. Turn around and, and let me do some history for you. Don't go digging up your past. Let me show you holy history. Because we, we can't perceive the future. We can perceive history. And he, he says to us, do you think I can help you the next day and the next and the next? Yeah, I think you can. So let's, let's just walk together. Let's, let's be in partnership, in friendship, in relationship with each other, and just walk. Let me, let me lead you, and you'll be fine. That's what Paul is saying here. These guys got together in Jerusalem and looked at each other. I mean, think of this. Looking at Saul, the persecutor. You mean, can you imagine Saul meeting Stephen's family for the first time? And yet they look at each other, and instead of hate, there's love. And they look back and they say, God has done this. Yeah, some of you went to the, the Jews, some of us are going to the Gentiles, but God is the one who's doing this. That's what church is about. That's what the body of Christ is about. We get caught up on such stuff. 
Just amazing. James, Cephas, and John, again, those esteemed as pillars. You realize there's really no pillars in God's church, in God's house. There's a foundation, Jesus. And then, you know, we, we do build rooms and things, and sometimes those rooms are reconfigured or walls are torn out and other rooms are built. And there's no pillars. But that's what people thought of, of these apostles as. And indeed, if there were pillars, the apostles were those pillars. But they would never claim it themselves. Paul is describing them that way. But these people, James, Peter, and John, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles as they do to the Jews. So far from having these, these people who snuck in and tried to ruin everything and to make us slaves again, far from them having victory, because we went there and talked lovingly and quietly about Jesus, they couldn't begin to make an argument. And what we discovered is that all of us who have accepted this gospel of Jesus Christ are one. And they extended to me, can you imagine, it's extended to me, the right hand of fellowship. And I'm the one who killed so many people and tried to destroy them, tried to ruin the churches, took the property of all these people, and yet they love me. Only the gospel can do that. Only the gospel. So what did they ask? was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I had been eager to do all along. Well, this? this is reference back to his previous trip when they, they brought supplies. Now, in that case, it was because of famine. In other cases, later on, it was because of persecution. Literally, these people were being starved out of their homes. And so Christians all around the Mediterranean area would collect money and, and food and things and send it to, to Israel. Send it to Jerusalem so these people could eat. That's all we ask is that you remember us. We're all part of the family. And we know they didn't do it just for Jerusalem. As Paul writes about, you know, getting care packages and various people who are sick but they've gotten well and we know you were praying. They were communicating with each other. They were in relationship with each other. So remember Paul's approach here as we start getting into deeper and deeper into the letter when he starts dealing with individual issues. Because it may seem like he's taking people's heads off. Because we read it that way. We, we insert ourselves into the story the way we are. But what Paul was doing, first and foremost, was saying, here's what I teach, and it's all about Jesus. What do you teach? Is it all about Jesus? And they go, well, yes. Go figure. How would that be possible without the miraculous God, and it isn't. Let's pray. Lord, when we see your wisdom coming out through these people, Paul and Peter and James and John, others that, that aren't named, but we know that, that they were involved, they were having these conversations, they had every reason to hate each other, every reason to compete, every reason to try to shout each other down, and yet they held back on their emotion and let your logic work the situation. And then when the emotion poured out, it was an emotion of thankfulness and joy. Love one for another. This isn't anything we humans can do, but it's what you do all the time. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name.